Hey guys, Jake Carlson here, host of the Modern Leadership Podcast. Are you ready to focus on amplifying your leadership superpowers? Let's go. Good morning, my friends, and welcome back to another episode of Modern Leadership. It is so good to be with you. And I got to be honest, this week has been a little bit tough. I mean, this is one of those weeks where the alarm clock seems to go off a couple minutes too early, and I have to burn that midnight oil a little bit to get things done, and I'm just wearing down. And I'm just looking, really looking forward to a break. I mean, I think sometimes you probably can relate to this, right? I mean, you're just working so hard and you just need a break. And that's why I'm so excited today to introduce today's guest expert, Aaron Edelheit. Aaron is the Chief Strategy Officer at Flow Technologies. He's also the founder of Mindset Capital, which is a private investment firm. He's been featured in the Wall Street Journal, CNBC, Bloomberg, the New York Times. He lectures all over the United States, Canada, South Africa on topics of investment and entrepreneurship. But the reason I wanted to have him on today is to talk about his newest book, The Hard Break, The Case for a 24-6 Lifestyle. I think you'll really enjoy this episode. So let me bring on Aaron. Aaron, it's so good to have you on the show with us today. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And like I was telling you in the pre-intro, this book, this concept that you have of you know taking a hard break is just something that is not just fascinating to me, but I think is so vitally important. So let me ask you, take me back to when you sat down and came up with this idea. What was going on in your life? What was going on in your mind that you said, this needs to be a book? So... First, let me explain that I'm a workaholic and I'm driven in ways that I'm not sure that I fully appreciate. And so I wrote this book really half to myself to remind myself uh, and to protect myself from my worst habits. But my um, the genesis of this book actually goes back uh, you know, 12, 13 years ago when after hitting a wall of working all the time, you know, trying to go, 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 and realizing that not only was my health suffering, but my business, my decision making, and my productivity, I wasn't getting out what I was putting in. And I realized that I needed a change. Well, let me ask you about that a little bit there. So you talk about how, you know, you're a workaholic, I'm a workaholic, so you and I relate on this matter. Uh, But you talk about that it was affecting not just your health, your mental state, but also you were looking at your return on investment, your time invested in work, and you weren't getting the same return on that. Can you dive into that just a little bit for me? So so, so here's the interesting thing is that, and, and I share this on physical, but most of people's jobs, most of the jobs today are about managing information. But it's managing information in the standpoint of problem solving, of being creative, coming up with innovative ideas, and it's 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 thinking out of the box to come up with the to to do that properly. It doesn't help for you to process more information, to read more emails, to read more things, to double down on your work and. You know, at the time I was uh, managing money, I had a small hedge fund um, and was investing in the stock market. And after four straight years of, you know, feeling like a rock star and trouncing everyone, I suddenly went through a a period of struggle that I write about in the book. Uh, And it wasn't any great, like, underperformance. I just wasn't prepared for it. And doubling down and working harder is not the answer uh, when you're trying to work yourself out of a problem, and I actually write this about this later in the book, and and, and I just didn't realize it, is actually many times, many money managers go through periods of underperformance. There's been times when Warren Buffett has been made fun of, uh, especially during the dot-com boom, and, you know, having perspective and experience is obviously very helpful. And, And so I realized that just... You know, I wasn't getting out, so I I, I fell back and and I said, okay, I, maybe I just need a break. And so I'm Jewish, and I thought, well, maybe I'll try some kind of Sabbath uh, observance of some kind. And and I 
Um, and I said, maybe I can try. I'll turn my phone off right before I go to bed, and then I'll try to make it till noon the next day. Like on a Friday night, like as as a, in Jewish faith, you observe the Sabbath. Friday on Saturday. night to Saturday yeah. night. That's right. But they even do it before like it goes dark, you know. And Christians do it on Sunday and. Um, you know, and, and it's not that I was religious or, you know, I was really just kind of scraping bottom and just trying to figure out, like, I didn't think I was just, just, just wasn't working. Like kind what of I was doing for was anything that would work. I mean, I'm willing to try anything. Yeah. And I just said, maybe I can, and you have to think about this. So at the time I was single, so, you know, maybe I wake up at seven or eight on a Saturday and, I wanted to make it till noon. So you're talking four or five hours on a Saturday. And it seemed like an impossible task. And it's so ridiculous. It's so ridiculous in hindsight. And so that I, after a couple of weeks, I tried to get to 2 to 3 p.m. And then eventually, after a couple of months, I was like, you know, I can do this all day. And I did it. And it transformed my life. It not only transforms uh, my personal life, but all of a sudden, it transformed how I work my capabilities, my ability to work harder, sustain longer for better decision-making ideas. My performance started to improve and it enabled me during the depths of the financial crisis to actually start a new business that I write about in the book called The American Home, where I bought, I started buying uh, um, foreclosed homes, fixing them up and renting them out. I started with 16 homes. At a time when everybody else that was investing in real estate was bailing out and getting out as quick as they could, you were leaning in. That's right. And people looked at me like I had a third eyeball. Yeah, you're nuts. Yeah. And so what I did is I built that to 2,500 single family rentals with full property management. And we sold the company to a publicly traded REIT three years ago. And that there's a lot in the story, ups and downs. It wasn't just this linear line where I saw an opportunity, took advantage of it, and everything worked out. Completely wonderful. There are a lot of mistakes and a lot of problems. Uh, one year we grew 10 times, um, which I don't recommend. Um, I would not have been able to succeed or come up with that idea, have the fortitude and see it all the way through if it wasn't for the fact that I took a day off every week. Well, when you say you're taking a day off, we started this conversation talking about basically just shutting your phone off. Uh, but what would you do? I mean, were you oh, so, spending so, time yeah, mentally? Yeah, that's a great question. So what my – and I talk about this in the book about like how you can do it. I call it the heartbreak. It's just another way of talking about a Sabbath. And so on Friday night, you know, what I do is I turn off my phone. I turn off my computer. And I don't – I try not to talk about business. And that is a time for family and friends. And I just do a whole bunch of other stuff that I don't get a chance to do during the week. And so what's, what, it, what happens to me is, one, by the end of the week, I mean, everybody's like this. You're just exhausted. You know, you've been running, 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 running. And I just get this big sigh and this big relief. And then it normally takes me about a day to fully recover. And by the time I turn back on, I am completely – I am – most of the time, completely rejuvenated, but also energized and rejuvenated and excited to connect back and go right back at it. And so, you know, some of the things I'll do is I'll go for a nap, I'll go for a hike, I'll watch a movie, but the movie is total fun. I'll read fiction for pleasure, not for self-improvement or things like that. And, and it just, it, you know, for a number of reasons, and this is what the book is about, is um, not only my story, but profiling lots of people across faiths, beliefs, uh, different industries who practice the Sabbath to tremendous success. And so what, the reason, going back to your original question, why did you write this book is because when I built the company, when I ran my company, I was interacting with so many people, employees, contractors, investment bankers, investors, um, you know, across the book. And I, I, what I see is basically a lot of unnecessary pain and suffering where people are grinding themselves down. Their personal lives are suffering. Their business productivity is suffering. And they're not getting anything out of it. And, 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 and so I said to myself, once I sold the company, I said, you know what, I'm going to spend time. I'm going to write a book about this. And how long did it take you to write the book? Three years. 
So part of it, part of it was there's 200 footnotes in the book, and every time I made uh, an assertion, I wanted it to be backed up by fact, either by studies. There's studies from the Centers for Disease Control, from Harvard, from Stanford, you know, across the board. And I wanted it to be, and basically, this is the business case for the Sabbath. This is for, you know, if your family, your spouse, your friend, your pastor, your rabbi, whoever, therapist came to you and said, you know what, you need a break. Your, your first reaction, and I know because this is me, would be, you don't understand the modern world. You don't understand business. You can't, I can't do that. Or you don't understand my current situation, right? I mean, I'm different. I'm unique. I can't take off this time because of what I do. And it's that special snowflake type of feeling that we have with about ourselves, that our situation is different from others. And I got to tell you, Aaron, as I've read through this book, you're absolutely correct. I mean, it's very well researched. And that's one of the things I think that really makes it stand apart from any of your competitors and other books that are being written right now is most people are trying to throw a book together in you know three months with no research to back it up this is just their opinion and their hypothesis and basically they're putting a pen to paper but what you've done is really put together a research project that is not just Aaron's opinion of what's going on this is actually validated proof of different positivities within uh, taking a break, within observing some sort of hard break on a weekly basis. And I got to share just a quick anecdote with you. I went to law school, oh, a long time ago. And when I went to law school, I mean, it's very competitive. I mean, they put a, a, a sign up on the wall that basically shows you your class rank. And you can see on a daily basis how you're, you're comparing to your colleagues and how you're comparing to those that you're competing against. And I did something, not because I read your book, obviously your book's new. I did something I didn't know why I was doing. It, it just seemed like the right thing at the time. But I took one day a week off from studying. And I didn't go to the library and I didn't open the book. And everything that you've been talking about, taking a break from your cell phone, taking a break from work, I found true. But the one thing that was even more powerful for me, and I wanted to talk to you about this and your experience with it, is I anticipated that day with excitement. I looked forward to that day and it helped me drive to the end of the week knowing that I was going to take that break. That's exactly right. You know, if you know that... You're going to get time off. You can drive yourself harder than you can imagine. So one, I just want to say thank you so much for those really kind words. Writing this book was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Um, and it took a lot longer than I thought because I wanted to do it the right way. Um, but you're exactly right. I know definitively, and I, I've been up since like 5.45 this morning. I, you know, I have three young kids, but I have been Today has been a hard work day, and you know a lot of us have hard work days. But I know that around a little, at, you know, in about 25, 26 hours, I know I'm off, and that uh, I know that it's a. This is why I wrote the hard break. It is a break, and it is definitive, and um, and it just. I'm looking forward to that, and I know that I can put in the hours to work, and I know that I'll have time. To rest and recover. To your point about law school, there's a wonderful story in the book about um, a, a guy named Sam Hafitz and his daughter, Rachel. Um, and Sam was a lawyer in New York City who uh, he said that he never saw the sun except through a window. That's how hard he was working. During law school, yeah. And, and a lot of medical students go through the same thing. And his, in his legal firm. And it basically tells the story of how he just realized, uh, you know, unfortunately, his daughter in the late 70s um, or mid 70s, actually, was born with um, a pretty, you know, terrible like uh, disorder. And uh, and it just kind of really crushed the family and he had to reprioritize his life. And eventually found a community that was welcoming to him when other people weren't. And he started integrating, for him, what was a religious Sabbath. And it transformed his life. And, and he talks about, do, you know, 
you know, some of the stories he told me, I only included one in the book, which is the, uh, that he would tell his clients he worked 24 six, that they would, they could contact him 24 hours a day, six days a week. He's a senior partner, mergers and acquisitions. If you know anything about mergers and acquisitions, most mergers and acquisitions happen on the weekend. They get consummated on the weekend. So I want you to imagine the amount of work that has to happen in and around. Leading right up to it. That's right. And to have a person who could say, who could operate with tremendous success and be in that specific aspect of law. And he told this one story that I absolutely love that they, you know, he, they found out one day that they were working on an offering for a large company. And in his due diligence as part of the law firm, they found that the CEO was lying or committing fraud. And he found out, like, on a, you know, he definitively put it together and had a call on Friday morning with the, uh, the main backer of this company. And he basically said, look, here's the, what I found. And the company needed the money, and this would have disrupted the whole thing. And he said, look, if it was me, my recommendation is you should let go of the CEO. But then, obviously, that complicates the financing. And and so, you know, Friday night rolls around. For him, he's religious. He's completely off. And so he, he turns off, and then Saturday morning, the senior partners of his law firm knock on his front door. And they know that for him, it's not just that, like, this is the real deal. Like, this is a religious, you know, belief. And um, knock on the door. And they know they can't talk about the, the specifics of the business case because he won't talk. So he said, instead, they started talking about uh, right and wrong. And in his words, they talked about the importance of not being a prostitute. And so suddenly, and in his southern drawl, because he, 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 he was working in Memphis, he said that the conversation elevated itself. Instead of getting stuck into the nitty gritty, they talked about principles. They talked about doing the right thing. And on Monday morning, that CEO was fired and they kept the, the company as a client and they did the right thing. But it was just this amazing story of dealing with the complexities of life and of real pressure and how the Sabbath actually put them on the right path. Well, and as you told that story and some of the things that jumped out to me is managing expectations. And I think that's a big reason that we have such conflict in our businesses, conflict within our families, is we don't manage expectations well. And as you talk about, you know, a father with a daughter and you talk about, you know, this this senior partner with his law partners, it was all about managing expectations, letting them know that you have me for 24-6. I'm here and I'm fully bought in and I'm going to be here to do everything that needs to be done. But the expectation is that we can accomplish this within this time. Now, on the flip side, when it comes to our family, you know, how much more valuable is it for our kids when they have this expectation that dad is getting off on Friday night and he's going to spend all day Saturday with us, not checking the cell phone. I took my daughter out last night. It was a daddy-daughter date and it was everything I had in me to avoid checking my email because I have a bunch of projects going on right now that are all coming to fruition at the same time and they all seem to be busy. But by managing that expectation of saying, look, I'm going to be with my daughter for these couple of hours, it gave me the strength to basically give her 100% attention. On the flip side, you look at her and the experience she had, she recognized, hey, dad was all in with me. And I think that's what's so valuable about what you're talking about. I love, I love what you say. I mean, I, I, I notice the same thing. So I have a four-year-old daughter, two-year-old son, and an eight-month-old son. It's a busy household. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my life is full. Um, on Saturday, oh, if it's just a regular day, I'm sitting on the floor playing with my four-year-old daughter, and she goes ahead, and I maybe I'll turn on some music on my phone, or I'll go to take a picture because she's doing something cute. And then all of a sudden I'll notice, oh, I've got an email, but there's a text. And then, I'm, you know, I have to check it, right? Absolutely, right? <laughs> I'm playing with it, but then it's only, a couple, it's only a couple of seconds, right? It's only like five, ten seconds. And she immediately turns and says, uh, Papa, will you play with me? But I am playing with her. But she knows that she doesn't have my full attention. That doesn't happen on the days that my phone is off. 
And it is a very, very powerful experience, not only with my daughter, but with friends, um, not having the outside world, you know, kind of intrude on us. And, and it's really the thought of thinking about, look, these phones and this technology, they're absolutely amazing. The fact that you can FaceTime with relatives and grandparents can talk to their grandchildren from thousands of miles away. It's amazing. But are we really willing to accept that we have electronic leashes on us 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Are we just going to accept that as a reality? Well, I think this is a good transition for us because I wanted to ask you about a couple of chapters in the book, and one of them ties directly to that. It's chapter five, and chapter five is entitled... Let's, let me turn to it real quick. Why are we overworking and overscheduling ourselves? And we've created this society basically where you know we feel like we're leashed, we feel like we're missing out. And you talk in this chapter about a number of reasons or a number of examples of people who are overworking and overstructuring themselves. And I wanted to ask you about it. So tell me about the working rich. Yeah, so this is the, the most amazing thing is you, you, you pull up the Wall Street Journal. I write about this. and Wall Street Journal you know, headline article or you know one of the headlines of the sections is why 4 a.m. is the most productive hour. And you then have you know executive act of executive being lauded for their early habits and who can outdo each other. And it's this really remarkable thing where you used to have like bankers hours where the rich would be like, ah, oh, you know, we work you know, 10 to 3, and then you'd be on the golf course, so you'd just be relaxing. But now things have flipped where the top 20% of earners are now twice as likely to work more than 50 hours a week than the bottom 20%. And uh, it, it's just this flip. And what's happened is, for a lot of people, it's become a status symbol. Um, and that they've actually done studies and that people view – those who are busier as having greater status. It's almost become as this, you know, bizarre signaling uh, value. Um, and, and so that's one aspect of it is that, you know, we're, we've gotten into this weird competition game of signaling who, is, who has the higher status because I work harder. Yeah, and we're seeing this. I just moved from San Jose, California, which is a very uh, busy place to live. And, you know, a lot of two income families, a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of people that are trying to climb the corporate ladder and having some success, a lot of very educated families. And you're absolutely seeing this. I mean, you go to a networking event and there's always a competition of, oh, I worked 80 hours this week, or I worked 90 hours this week, or I didn't even go home this week. I worked all 168 hours this week. And it's really become this badge of honor that we try to wear. And, and this is part of the book is I try definitively to show that once you work past 55 hours, it's all garbage. Like this is part of showing the studies and the research that in the short term, you can grind for like a week or two, you can put in 80 or hundred hour a week and get it done. But over the long term, what happens is your productivity plunges, you get sick, you get injured, you make mistakes. And my book is literally is, is filled with study after study definitively proving this. So now you can basically, when, when people talk to you about that, like, oh, I had, I'm working this, I'm doing that, you can say, well, you know, in your brain, or you can just say it, it's like, you may not be as productive as you think you are. Or you may not be using, utilizing your hours. And there's a lot of studies that are showing nowadays that if you don't take time to think, especially as a leader, that you're really missing some opportunities. If you're just acting. That's the most remarkable part of what I found in my research is that the latest. And so again, back to this point, like all of our what we're trying to do is we're trying to be creative, innovative, stand out, you know, really you know, elevate ourselves. So how do you do that? You've got to be creative. How do you be creative? The answer is not to grind. So they actually found the latest in neuroscience. And this is, so you have a practice of the Sabbath that's thousands of years old, right? The latest in neuroscience shows that there's a part of your brain called the default mode network. Now, what's the default mode network doing? The default mode network takes in the information that you're experiencing 
the experiences, tries to gain understanding, tries to form patterns. And when does the default mode network get activated? When you're resting. So you actually think that your brain isn't doing anything when you uh, when you go for a walk or you're not on your phone or you're bored or whatever, but your brain is there's a part of your brain that goes into overdrive, and that's the part that makes you creative. The most the artists, the most creative people have the strongest default mode network. And so how does this manifest itself? Have you ever had the proverbial idea in the shower? Always. In fact, that was what was on my uh, mind as you were talking about this. That's exactly. You go for a walk and all of a sudden some solution to your problem. Bing. That's because there's a part of your brain that's working when you're not uh, – when, when you don't think it is. And there's many examples of this from like Einstein. When he would get stuck on a problem, he would go famously walking without socks or he would just pick up a violin and just start playing it. And to – a you know, modern day, the most innovative and creative Broadway play to come out in decades, Hamilton. How was that created? Well, Lynn Manuel Miranda, the creator, was going on vacation and in the airport bookstore was looking for something to read on vacation and picked up the biography of Alexander Hamilton. And then when he was on vacation, read it and he had the space and time to think something totally crazy of like, a multiracial cast rapping about our founding fathers. Which has gone gangbusters and is so exciting. I just want you to know that I continue to enter the lottery every single day to fly around the country to see this thing. Uh, it, it's so wonderful. Hey, let me ask you, Aaron, about from that same chapter, I want to ask you about the Ziger, Zigernik effect. I think it's pronounced the Zygarnik effect. You got it. Zygarnik effect. Yeah, yeah. So this is just a fascinating, a, a very, very fascinating thing. I found it super fascinating. And this is part of the research. So you wonder, like, why is it that, you know, beyond, you know, what is it? What's going on in our brain that is causing us um, to keep working sometimes. And, you know, there's a lot of good reasons. Like, we want to compete. We want to get ahead. It's not all about status. But it turns out there's this psychological phenomenon known as the Zygarnik effect. I call it a compulsion. It's a compulsion. That's right. When you have an uncompleted task, it stays on your brain and literally almost weighs on it. And you can't forget it until it's complete. And they found this by studying waiters, that waiters would remember the orders that were completely finished, but they couldn't remember the orders that had been completed. And so they've studied this a number of ways, and it turns out, so think of all the emails in your inbox, all the to-dos. Like many of us work on projects that are almost like never-ending, or there's new projects popping up all the time. So part of the reason you have your phone on and you're working all the time is because you have this endless Zygarnik effect. So how do you actually combat it? Well, one of the, one of the ways is to simply turn off and to tell your brain I'm not going to work on my projects for this amount of time. I'm going to pick it up when I turn back on. And so a lot of this in my book is I give tips and tools around not, not just if you recognize, hey, I need a heartbreak, but how to do it and how to like fight back against the ways that are, you know, the things that are going on that are literally hacking your brain to, to com, in, a, in this compulsive manner, work and use technology. Well, and the compul- and not just the, but not just that, but also this culture that we have, this uh, expectation from those around us that are making us feel like we have to be on all the time. That if we take a, a break, we're going to lose our jobs, or we're going to lose our position, our reputation, or our standing. Really taking that break and recognizing that the world is not going to come to a standstill just because you don't answer your phone for twenty four hours. That's exactly right. There's. The story about Boston Consulting Group that I share. So consultants are notorious, like crazy hard workers, right? Yeah. So Boston Consulting Group is having a problem where people are burning out and they're only really staying with the firm a couple of years and then bouncing off because it's so intense. And they're like, how do we increase engagement? How do we get people to see, to stay with the firm? And so this Harvard professor comes to them and says, I have this idea. I want to try an experiment of what happens if the consultants had um, some time off that they knew they had every week. And so they, 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 the senior partners are like, okay, try to, we'll 
find a team and we'll try a this small as a beta group. A, a, a small small experiment she searches the entire firm no one wants to do it so i want you to imagine the bosses are like hey we're gonna give you paid time off you don't have to work and the reaction is no no don't not me because i don't want to fall behind to your point it's gonna hurt my career i'm gonna fall behind i'm not gonna be able to service my clients Eventually, the senior partners have to intervene with one team and say, no, we've got your back. Just try this for a short term period. And they try this. This team tries it almost immediately after a couple weeks. They're like, oh, my gosh, I'm so refreshed. I'm having ideas. They start working better together where they realize, like, wait a minute. Why are we having three hour meetings? Maybe we should just have 30 minutes because we have this time that we're going to be off. And people are like backing each other up. And they had greater understanding of each other's jobs. It starts spreading to the office and other people are like, well, I want time off. I mean, these are people who are saying the results, the client feedback was like, this is, they're really fantastic. They decide to roll it out to the entire firm. It's called predict, in, in, it, it's wonderful consultancy, predictable time off or something I call the, the Sabbath. Um, And they're now the number three best company to work for. Their engagement in the company has exploded. And they're literally thriving because of this. And it's now a competitive advantage for them to retain key talent and to service their customers. And I think this leads us directly into one of the most astounding things that I read in your book, chapter four, why don't Americans like going on vacation? And you basically say that there are 662 million unused vacation days. But on top of that, what I thought was amazing is that Americans forfeited 206 million vacation days that could not be rolled over. So this isn't a matter of, I'm going to take more vacation down the road. This is use it or lose it, and we still had 206 million hours thrown away. Tell me about this. Yeah. Well, no, I think it's part of this, and this is why I wrote the book, I'm trying to change world culture. I'm trying to shine a light on something that literally doesn't make sense. It hours worked does not equal, you know, output or the desired outcomes. And there's many examples I use in the book, but you know, the fact that people are giving up paid vacation is absurd. There's actually some CEOs who are realizing this and they're realizing their employees not only need to go on vacation, but they need to disconnect on their vacation. So there, there's one CEO I profile in the book who has a policy called paid, paid vacation. And that is he pays his employees a bonus for completely disconnecting on their paid vacation. That is the most unique thing I've ever heard of. Yes, it's like this. And, you know, I'll give you another example. So the Greeks work something like five or the average Greek Uh, person works about five or six hundred hours more a year than the average German. Okay. Germany has something like 29 or 30 paid vacation days. Which workforce do you think is more productive? Well, I wondered where you were going with this question because I thought you were going to say that the Greeks are doing so well. And I'm like, boy, their, their economy is in shambles. I mean, they're really struggling. Because it doesn't have to do with the amount of hours you clock in. It's how you use those hours. And that actually the time off and the the way that you are productive, that's what leads to success. Not grinding and just putting in hours. Well, I want to ask you your feeling and your opinion on something. So I work for a company that basically has unlimited vacation time. So I can take whenever I want. Uh, but because I don't have measurable vacation time, I basically never take it. Yeah. So my, I actually am not a fan of unlimited vacation because what happens is that you have peer pressure come in and you start feeling guilty. Like one, you're not a team player. You're not committed to the company and you don't actually know what is right and what you should be taking. And so it's actually a tool. Unfortunately, there is some you know, some people that use it as like, hey, I'm trying to be good and people can take time off as they want. But what happens is, is that there's a lot of peer pressure and that you have to stay at work and you don't take the time off that you actually uh, need and should have. 
And then there's other companies that actually use it as a way to discourage people and try to have people work as long as possible. And it just doesn't work. I appreciate you jumping into that a little bit for me. That was just a personal question that I had here at the end. You know, I look at our time, Aaron, and we are running just a bit shy of, you know, time to get jump off and get back to doing the things that we need to do to finish out our week and take our Sabbaths. But uh, before I let you go, I got a couple of questions in a section I call learning from leaders, uh, just learning a little bit more about you. How does that sound? Sure. It sounds great. So if you were to look on your Kindle or your bedside table, what are you reading right now? Uh, so I have, um, I'm reading uh, a couple of books right now. Uh, I actually just finished a wonderful book that I would highly recommend. I literally just finished it called Pachinko. It's a uh, kind of like a historical fiction book uh, following a couple of generations of Koreans as they go before, during, and after World War II, and they go to Japan. It was like a national book finalist uh, or a finalist for a national book award. It's a wonderful book. I'm pretty sure my wife has read it. That sounds exactly like the kind of book she picks up. She would love it, yeah, if she hasn't read it. Wonderful. How about your leadership superpower? My leadership superpower, um, I would say is telling a, kind of telling a story and really having people buy into it. Which is so vitally important today because it's one way that we connect with other people and it's another, it's a way that our message connects with them. So I think that's an absolutely valuable superpower. Aaron, before we let you go, how can we find out more about you? How can we pick up the hard break and any last bit of advice you'd like to share with us? Yes. So thank, well, one, thank you for having me on. So, but you can find my book on Amazon, uh, The Hard Break, The Case for a 24-6 Lifestyle. You can go to my website, which is uh, thehardbreak.com. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, I'm Aaron, A-A-R-O-N, Value. You can find me on Facebook, Aaron M. Edelheit, author of The Hard Break. Um, and uh, what I would also say is, you know, my last message is that this resonates with you. And, you know, one, I, you know, it would be great if you could get the book, but help me spread this message. I wrote this book to spread the message, to try to change work culture, to tra change the conversation around technology and technology use. And I need help doing that. And the Modern Leadership audience is notorious for the groundswell. So we will help you spread this message, not just because you're a great speaker and it's a great book, but because what you talk about, what you're teaching is so vitally important. And it goes against what our current culture is trying to teach us within our work environment, within our usage of cell phone and, and so on. And so I think this is absolutely a valuable conversation. I can't thank you enough for spending time with us. Thank you for being this week's Modern Leader. Thank you. All right, my friends, what did you think of that? Wow, I got to tell you, as I mentioned in the intro to this episode, it's been a busy week. It's been tiring. I feel like I'm working up and down, you know, early mornings, late nights. And I got to tell you, I'm looking forward to this break. I like the idea of a hard break. And as I talked to Aaron and I shared the story in the episode, you know, there was some real power when I was in law school of separating basically my study schedule and taking that day off. I really looked forward to it. And when I was in that day, the things that I was doing, either the television shows I was watching or the things that I was doing, I felt no guilt. I felt no pull to go and study in the library. And I think that's real power of setting expectations and knowing exactly what you want to do and what you're willing to do and taking that break. Of course, everything that we talked about, including how to connect with Aaron, can be found on the show notes for this episode, which are over at jakecarlson.com slash ML80, episode 80. And uh, until next week, I want to wish you the very best of days and even better life. Don't forget to take a hard break and stay awesome. Thanks for listening to the Modern Leadership Podcast. 
You can find me on Facebook at Speaker Jake, on Twitter at Jake A. Carlson, and of course the website, jakeacarlson.com. See you there. Bye.